testimony and for being with us today. Um, Mira? Yes, so uh, thank you very much. And we'd like to now invite Hillary Shelton, who is the Senior Vice President for Advocacy and Policy from the NAACP. Uh, and he has a long history of working on a variety of civil rights issues, and we welcome him to testify. Thank you very much. It is an odd game I'm such old friends. <laughs> Matter of fact, I went to lab, and the first time I came to visit, my hair was still black. So it's very good for you. It's good to see you, Mr. Zabi, as always. Matter of fact, I think last time we had a chance to spend time together on that bench on, uh, never mind. We'll talk later. <laughs> very good. But nonetheless, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. No, very good. As I mentioned, my name is Hillary Shelton. I'm director of the NAACP's Washington Bureau and serve as senior vice president for policy and advocacy. I'm here today to humbly ask the committee to have once again consider the issues important for the NAACP and, of course, the communities we serve. Many of you know that we're the largest and oldest civil rights organization in the United States. We have over 500,000 card-carrying members with units in every state in the United States, but we're also still on military bases in Italy, Germany, Korea, and Japan. I've submitted a written statement because we have a tendency to be a little long-winded, and I know we're going to try to keep this short and simple, but I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may very well have to us as a number of issues that are important to us. On criminal justice matters, as you can imagine, that's an issue that's huge for the African-American community. There's probably no community that, ex that experiences the disparities in sentencing and other concerns as, the as those that, that are the NAACP very well serves. On the issue of racial profiling, as you know, African Americans make up about 13% of the national population. But if you think about how often we're stopped for no good reason except the color of our skin, which is not a good reason to be stopped, you see this problem lies very deep and very important to us. As you know, when we think about the importance of law enforcement, the NAACP has always believed, going back to the days of W.E.B. Du Bois, that one of the most important issues that confront the African American community is the issue of criminal justice. And indeed, from every attorney general I've talked to, and my hair is gray enough to have talked to many going back to Janet Reno and talking to every single one since, including Loretta Lynch, about the same issue. Whenever these concerns come up, they respond in the same way. They say racial profiling has to stop, that indeed it undercuts the trust and integrity that's necessary for law enforcement to be effective. And as such, we have to make sure that it does not happen, or we cannot, at the front end, prevent crimes from happening, or at the back end, solve them after they've occurred. In essence, we need good policy to address those concerns, and there are two bills pending on Capitol Hill we hope we can get behind yet again. At the end Racial Profiling Act introduced by John Conyers in the U.S. House of Representatives, and the same bill was introduced by Ben Cardin in the U.S. Senate. There are bills that address these issues very strongly, and it's our hope that we can adopt those as priorities at this convention as well. As we move through the criminal justice system, we know the issues of sentencing disparities are also very big and extremely important to us as well. If you look at African Americans that commit the same crimes as white Americans in the society, you'll find that we spend much more time in prison for the commission of the same crimes. You find the rush to judgment happens much more often, and that oftentimes that rush to judgment happens in a way that is even deadly. So with that, we'd also ask for you to consider moving a policy position to actually call for a repeal of the federal death sentence. In essence, we know that a lynching is a lynching. Whether you did it in the 1930s or whether you did it in 2000 plus, indeed, the rush to judgment has created the same outcome. The cost is overwhelming and unnecessary. If you watch your TVs, when, usually when you see someone coming out of prison, because they found that indeed they sentenced them, they were wrong. When we go through the process of looking at DNA evidence and other things that are done, we find out that they indeed didn't commit the crime. But nonetheless, what we find is that most often who you'll see walking out of those jail cells are African Americans as well. We've got to address that issue because again, not only are the sentencing ranges long and unnecessary, mandatory minimum sentences and other issues along those lines, but executing someone for a crime they cannot, did not commit is something I think none of us want to see or want to have. Data from the Death Penalty Information Center tells us that 45% of all the Americans that were sentenced to death and later free because they were found to be innocent were African American. Take that a step further. 35% of all those who were sentenced to death and executed and later found to be innocent were also African Americans. That is over 300% of our representation in society is unnecessary. It costs too much. The lives of those human beings, but not the dollars and cents of, quite frankly, of the taxpayers are also a big component of this. It is our help, our hope, 
that we can move forward and actually eliminate the federal death penalty once and for all. It's happening at the state level. Let it also happen at the federal level, too. We know we have to address the issues of what happens throughout the process of, of us addressing education in our society. We know we've moved a long way, and we're delighted that we're able to pass something called the ESSA. The, the Every Student Succeeds Act is a major step forward and corrects many of the problems that came out of, quite frankly, the so-called no child left behind. The problem for us was that most of the children left behind happened to look like me. And in addition, what we found is in states like Florida that became the prototype for the Bush administration, after they passed the No Child Left Behind Act, they left it to every state to actually decide what test they would use. It gave them an overall guidance, but here's what happened initially. What happened is that 55% of all African American males graduating from high school were held back because they weren't, were unable to pass that high stakes test. 55% throughout the state of Florida. That is a shame, it is a national disgrace and an international embarrassment. Indeed, we want to make sure as we move to the ESSA bill through, now that it's passed, we have to make sure its implementation is one that is priority for Democrats all over the country so we can address those concerns as well. Hillary, I just need to, we're just late in the hour, so. Short and sweet. <laughs> all right. Let me say that as we think about education, we're thinking about college. And indeed, we know that 75% of all African American students are eligible for needs-based financial mm -hmm. aid. Their parents fall into that category. But we also know that Pell Grant maxes out at about $5,400, and we know student loans are equally as important and sometimes downright predatory. It's important for us to make sure that every American child is able to go as far as their minds would take them and not their mom and daddy's pocketbooks. Mm -hmm. Indeed, we want to see those increases in Pell Grants. And let me say this as I really age myself. When I was applied to Howard University back in <laughs> <laughs> I got a Pell Grant that covered all of my tuition. I had to all go in debt for a room and board and books, but my tuition was fully paid. On this day in America, that is not the case. We're not looking at things like education at the priority level that we very well should. The last issue is criminal justice, and the final position is we want to see body cameras. We know that our police officers very well say things that are not true. You've seen very recently in the news that those police officers would very well forget they had the body cameras on and shoot a man to death at the University of Cincinnati and tell a story that was simply not true. Thank God for that body camera. Mm -hmm. We want to go beyond body cameras. We also think dash cams important for us to continue to embrace and a gun cam is something that's also available in which every place you point that gun it begins recording it right away. So a police officer can face one way and shoot another way and it will all be captured. We're convinced of this and so many other issues that are in our rather long testimony that's been, right, that's been presented to you are things that are extremely crucial and important to our communities. And, and, and we, we definitely look forward to reviewing and looking at your written testimony and all the ideas of the NAACP. State Representative Reese. Thank, thank you and this is uh, I guess somewhat of a loaded question. Um, I think it's very critical the National NAACP Convention will be in, uh, in my hometown of Cincinnati the week before the um, Democratic National Convention. And so our platform or whatever we come out of here with certainly will be um, talked about with the membership there. And it'll be also during the same time as the RNC Convention and uh, the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus Convention. My, my question um, for the NAACP, because you deal with so many issues, um, I want to focus on voting rights. Yes. Uh, I want to focus on criminal justice and black colleges. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. You mentioned uh, Howard, and I'm a graduate of Grambling State, and so many uh, black colleges, I know in Ohio, Wilberforce being the oldest, have concern about a having black colleges included in the platform where they're graduating um, the largest amount of African American, particularly males, uh, in a time when we are looking for males uh, to be productive. So I wanted to ask you a question on if there's a platform uh, or within your platform that we could have that f highlights and focuses on the importance of historically black colleges and what can be done, because I know they have been uh, struggling over, you know, decades uh, for survival. Um, and then on voting rights, uh, 
in, o in Ohio, we have over 100,000 signatures that we've collected for a voter bill of rights constitutional amendment. My question to you, um, do we move, need to move toward a constitutional amendment? Is there something uh, in the platform from the NAACP that we may need to consider as we take Dr. King uh, movement now to more a permanent effect and so I don't have these lawsuits every other week that I've got going on in, in Ohio, although we're winning them, um, but costing the taxpayers a lot of money. And then my last question on criminal justice, um, we, we dealt with a lot. I know body cameras, certainly that happened in Cincinnati, so we are su supportive of that. Um, but also you talked about racial profiling, not just in data collection, but in people getting uh, profiled, arrested, or yes. wrongfully arrested, uh, and then the cost that it cost them to get it off their record. So I don't know if you've seen auto erase that has been adopted in several <laughs> states. Is that something that the NAACP thinks that we should take a look at when someone is stopped and they are automatically erased because they did nothing wrong, but now you would have to pay so many fees that get our folks caught up in the system. You want to talk about that? Thank you so much, and I know that each one of those could take 10 minutes in of itself, so I just sadly have to ask you to, to be brief in your comments. Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Very quickly, yes, the information we presented to you also includes support for HBCUs. We think the White House office on HBCU needs to be strengthened and be given the ability to actually steer more HBCUs to some of the other forms of uh, support or finance uh, that many of the other major colleges and universities are able to get from the various government agencies. One of the ways that schools like Harvard and so many other schools are able to do so well is because they get research grants and other things to also help pay for their expenses at those schools. We'd like to see more of that direction happen for HBCUs as well. Again, scholarship money is crucial. And as so we talk about HBCUs, we really have to find a way right back around to the issue of, of financial aid. Indeed, we know, again, disproportionately the students that attend HBCUs come from poor families. But we also know that HBCUs have been more effective at being able to graduate African Americans and prepare them for life than any of the universities in our country. They have that track record. They've always had that track record, and it continues to be true. So those resources very much need to be in place. Of course, building funds are important for HBCUs as well. Grants that allow them to, to actually rebuild the existing schools and expand their campuses and whatnot to include new programs is extremely important as well. So the number of issues along those lines we think are crucial to us. Unless you have a question back up, I want to jump to voting rights before I get beat up. I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me say on the issue of voting rights, we're very much with you. We'd always push to improve and strengthen the Voting Rights Act of 1965 through something called the Voter Empowerment Act. This is one that extends those protections for voting and actually puts in place things like automatic registration, issues of being able to make sure that our kids have access to the polls as they should, reenfranchisement of felony offenders, and other issues that are very important to us in the area of voting. We know we have to repair the Voting Rights Act of 1965 after that nasty Shelby versus Holder decision. It was unnecessary, and even Jim Sensenbrenner, a Republican from Wisconsin that was responsible for the 2006 reauthorization went after the uh, Supreme Court as being intrusive and otherwise erroneous in their approach to addressing those issues. We think that's important to move in that direction as well. We've got to pass the uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act of, of, of 2016. We want to pass the Voter Empowerment Act. We want to pass the Democracy Restoration Act, which speaks to addressing the over 5 million Americans that are now in prison or are out of prison but still cannot vote because we do have many states under our federalist system that do not give you the right to restoration of your voting rights. It's up to the governor to decide whether they want to do it or you can take it to a federal judge and hope you can afford to pay for that or take it directly to the state legislature and have them put your individual name in to be considered by the full House and Senate of that state for restoration. We know that disproportionately affects African Americans and so many others at a time. When someone comes out of prison, all of our experts tell us, that the best way to keep people from going back into prison is to make sure you enshrine them a, with a sense of ownership. If they believe they have some control and ownership of the process and voting is the number one way you do that, then indeed we can actually prevent much of the recidivism and we've seen over the last few years, and again, thank God for Barack Obama, for Eric Holder, and now Loretta Lynch, programs have been put in place that are not the law but are the guidances within our Justice Department that have helped reduce the number of those incarcerated. At the time Obama went in, 2.4 million. 
as we sit here today, just under 2.2 million, and the numbers continue to go down. But the issue of those being able to vote is extremely important. Last point I'll leave is one that was given to me by a good friend who happens to be a Democrat, uh, Pat Leahy from Vermont. The first time I took to him a, a bill to actually restore voting rights immediately upon people leaving prison, he started laughing as we were walking across the Capitol grounds. And I couldn't believe he'd laugh at me about something like this, uh, uh, Madam Congressman. But indeed, he laughed and said, I apologize for laughing, but I'm for Vermont. In Vermont, you can be an ax murderer and not lose your right to vote. He said, as a matter of fact, it's a wonderfully humbling experience for me to have to go into prisons to campaign for re-election. Can you imagine the effect that would have on some of these extremist politicians if the same people that they wrote those awful, strenuous, ex extreme laws to lock people up and throw away the key are the same people they had to go back and ask they could go back to Congress? Would that not be a wonderful change, Madam Lee? Indeed, so the, the last point is racial profiling, and we still have to address that issue. Racial profiling is the front end of the criminal justice system for most Americans. If you're on the wrong neighborhood and you're wrong color, they pull you over because you're suspicious. If you're driving down the road and you, and you don't look to the side when the police cruiser pulls up, they consider you suspicious and they pull you over. If you slow down a little bit, you're suspicious, you get pulled over. If you speed up a little bit, you get, you're suspicious, you get pulled over. The bottom line is that what is considered suspicion when it comes to racial and ethnic minorities and African Americans very specifically is outrageous. As a matter of fact, we need to make sure we do a number of things on this area. First, we want to make it clear that racial profiling is an illegal practice. We want to stop that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your, your patience with me. It's good to see you, by the way, Congressman. Good seeing you. And secondly, we want to make sure that we set the policies clear and begin to retrain our police officers on that policy. Thirdly, we want to make sure we hold them accountable. And lastly, we want to give every American a private right of action. So and when indeed this kind of discrimination occurs, that they have the power and the authority to actually bring the lawsuits against the individual police officers and the police department itself, holding them accountable as well. And lastly, I would say no good policy goes without data collection. In order to manage a problem, you must first measure it. That means we have to get past a bunch of these police unions and others and make sure that every time someone is stopped, we're able to keep tabs on that, and it's a whole lot easier than it sounds. You can take a PDA now and simply mark the spot that expresses what the police officer felt about the person or thought the person was at the time they were pulled over. Let us collect that data and make sure we can move to stronger, more stringent policies that addresses this awful scourge and, quite frankly, undercuts the very integrity and effectiveness of our law enforcement community. Thank you. Three Thank out you of three. Much. Thank you. <laughs> They tell I can me tell you're my friends. Yeah, they tell, me, they tell me you've gotten quite a bit of testimony in. Uh, yes, sir. Congress of Commons is good to see you. The answer is yes. So as usual, you answer the question before they are asked. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.